Well, good morning everyone and welcome. We are glad to have you in this session web seminar, part of the Open Ed project. And as you know, we want to make synergies and collaboration, everything to find an improvement in all this education process we are going through in these current changes because of the continuous crisis since the pandemic. So today I would like to start by reminding you that for you to get the certificate of this project, this uh, series of seminars, you must attend at least eight out of the 10 seminars, answer the form with the three questions, with the contents of each one of the seminars, and also answer the opening uh, questionnaire and the closing questionnaire of the event. Today, we are still celebrating. We are so happy to receive another researcher that really has been a, a breakthrough in trends and is going to give you many other options for us to think where from and where to work to support education from our environment and in the global level with the collaborations we can make. And today, we are going to uh, hear Jose Vladimir Bulgos Aguilar, He's a master's in IT uh, management and also in information sciences and knowledge administration by the Tech of Monterrey. His investigation li research lines focus on the development of technological strategies for education, educational innovation, knowledge management, and open educational movement. National director of libraries of the Technological School of Monterrey. He is also a member of the um, uh, lecture UNESCO for Latin America and from International Council for Open for Distance Education member OER Latin America and member of the board of the regional not for open ed for LATAM sponsored by the Global Consortium of Education OE Global. He has been a project leader and consultant in implementing different initiatives for education and innovation like the mobile learning system, institutional repository, the generation of the open access institutional policy of Tech de Monterrey, among others. He is author of specialty books on ed educational theology and education from publishers like Trillas and Ibusa, and he is also author of other books, and also with research articles in educational innovation and knowledge administration. It is an honor that he is here today with us, and I think he is going to set the foundation for new collaboration possibilities. So the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Burgos, and welcome. Thank you for the space. I'm glad to uh, have this conversation with you. A while ago, I was talking to the organizers, and they told me they, more than 700 people are following us from around the world. I would really like, if it is possible, that you can uh, write your comments in the chat, where you are from, what university you represent, so that we can greet you. And to have it clear where you are from today. I also want to use this time to share that the space we are going to have is for a dialogue. I would appreciate if in the comments, as we are presenting some of the topics or the concepts or challenges, if any one of you is uh, working already on a project or initiative in your institution, would you please share the URL where we can go and see the website or the presentation or some information about that project for that knowledge and to share experiences with all of us. This is the purpose, to share with all of you a little bit of this experience that we have had. I'm sorry we lost the connection. That we all are developing in this space that allows us in this forum. I'm going to start my presentation today and I appreciate if at the end, we can have a Q&A session. The organization team is going to moderate these questions so that at the end, we can answer them. Like I said, 
uh, like our moderator said, remember there are some requirements for you to get the participation certificate. And here I show them to you. Remember, you must uh, answer the first and the last survey to take at least eight out of the 10 seminars, and you must answer three specific questions in each one of the webinars. Here, you can see the three questions that are going to be in the electronic form so that when you go to answer the form, you will have it clear on how to answer. And of course, as we present the slides and the content, you can take notes of what is going to be asked to you in each one of the questions. And I also want to start the session today with a brief uh, survey or a consultation. Please go into your browser and go to the address you see on the screen, www.menti.com. And in that session, the code you must include is the one you see here, 46830094. And this is going to allow us to quickly have a first uh, information from you, your opinion of the expectation or the scope you want to take from this lecture. I'm going to start my conversation and when I see some answers from all of you, I'm going to show the results. <clears throat> and then we will be back to this consultation. So again, www.menti.com and the code is 46830094. I see that somehow, You, we are getting the answers so that you can see the role that you think that library must have when spreading open and inclusive education. And there are three options. One is the leader drive or push being sensitiveness as an important stakeholder in our area to trigger these initiatives. And the second option that you see here is collaborator. And I participate with other areas, but not necessarily I lead the initiative and the other is an enabler. I just enable or give support when necessary. But I am not an active member. I'm just an enabler. And what I see is that the answers we are getting is that you think that the library must have a leadership role. And having a leadership role is not easy. So we have to break paradigms, work schemes, processes, and this is a big challenge. However, it is something we are certain, for what I see, that we have to do in our competences. It's very interesting, uh, this, uh, the results of this consultation. As a reference framework, I'm going to take the sustainable development objectives stated in the UN General Assembly adopted for the 2030 agenda as an action plan in favor of the people, the planet, prosperity, as a target to strengthen peace and access to justice. This framework of reference has 17 development objectives, as you can see here, and they are put together and undivisible. The scope is for worldwide and for universal applications. And of course, we must take into consideration the different realities, capabilities, development levels in each country and entity, respecting their policies and priorities for development. From this reference framework, I'm going to take one of the development objectives. And this is the number four, 
and this is quality education in this sustainable development objective that is a number four it says that we want to guarantee an inclusive education and equitative education with quality promoting learning opportunities throughout the life for everyone you can consult more information on this statement that is being made on this reference framework the one that i am sharing here and at the end we can answer some of the questions as well remember that this objective in particular and in consensus by many is education is the one that has a core positions in the 2030 agenda performance because in this action environment of the agenda we have this objective broken down in seven goals and three means of implementation it can be said it represents the development platform and socioeconomical uh, mobility going up this is clear for development and the well-being generation where this type of initiatives is implemented in the world forum on the inchen in the in education in korea in 2015 they made this reference framework from which i take some content and that i am showing here as a summary to introduce the surrounding or the context environment about the role the library is going to take in this under this umbrella or performance they say fundamental principles in the action framework in the ancient statement and they say education is a fundamental right and enabler on this topic they say that for this right to be a reality the countries must guarantee a universal access and equivalent to education and inclusive learning with quality and equality with mandatory uh it's mandatory to never let anyone behind. Second point is education is a public good and it's also a common cause of society. And it requires the state's participation in the application of public policies. Last but not least, it says gender equality is linked to the right of education for everyone because we need a focus based on the rights that guarantees not only that girls and boys women and men will get access to the different teaching levels and for them to be successful in them but also that they can get the same competences on education and through it on this framework they state some strategic focuses and i am taking one that is stated to focus on quality and learning this is point number two of the paper and the uh, extract that is referred here is in particular contextualized into the libraries as well and because of the materials the contents the books learning materials educational resources of free access technology itself they must be available for everyone and for all the students this is a fundamental premise that we must guarantee and within the educational goals and the indicational strategies in this action framework the 4.3 goal when it is broken down as an objective the ods4 talks about ensuring equivalent access for every man and women for a technical professional and superior formation with quality including university uh, learning it means that the access opportunity for the higher educational levels frequently are not enough and in particular the countries that are not so advanced and it brings a gap of knowledge with serious consequences for the economical and social development and the well-being of that country or entity what the goal asks is that in these points in particular that number 38 and 43 38 says, it is fundamental to reduce the obstacles and the limitations 
that ensure access to education. It's necessary to facilitate learning opportunities throughout the life. On point 43, it says, distance education and also the educational resources of free access can improve the equity, quality, and the pertinence. Those points are really important and fundamental for the framework we are putting together in this uh, speech. And that tertiary education must be progressively free according to the existing international agreements. One of the obstacles or limitations we are facing from the perspective or the library point of view is the cost of education for the students. Access to the information resources can represent a limitation or an obstacle. I want to address this narrative. And here I show you a chart that I am taking from the statistics office in the United States. And as you can see, the price index to consumers here, I take some of the categories that the office represents and that can impact the student's education. You can see, for example, the upper yellow line, the, the uh, cost of enrollment or fees uh, has grown at more than 1,000%. And in the case we see here, seven out of 10 graduates finish studies with a debt, more or less, $30,000 USD at least, and it could represent an impact in their quality of life and future development. As for information resources, you can see the red line. And yeah, it has had an exponential growth, more than 900%. And here, obviously, I'm taking a history data from 1980 to 2020. You can go to this website and simulate other scenarios, <clears throat> reduce years, 20 years, 10 years, and you will get other rates. But what I want us to see here is that the growth has been important about the cost of the textbooks. And it brings me to a study that has been done in the United States. And this study is on the third edition already. And the edition they released this year is showing in a synthesis that the textbook industry needs some arrangement or some fixing. They say there are important opportunity areas for example, they say in the study that the students that consulted are concerned about the textbook costs on 2020, 65% of the students stated they didn't buy textbooks because of the cost of them. In the previous year, 63% didn't buy the textbook as well. It doesn't mean they are not concerned, they are aware that this could affect in a negative way their grades or their academic performance. 90% says are really concerned on this regard. So what do we have to do from the libraries to facilitate textbooks? Here, I also show you another important chart because from the libraries, we are offering access and information resources, databases, information, electronic information resources. And here you can see there has been an increase, exponential increase on the academic and research library expenditure. It's been more than 166% on this growth, high above other uh, resources, but they are the challenges we see from the library when we talk about guaranteeing access to the information resources on 2012 
you can see that a university, Harvard, after a study in a council they have in the library, they got a result and they say that they can't maintain the cost or the payment of those subscriptions. It's not feasible to continue with this type of uh, subscriptions in their current base. It's unsustainable, financially speaking, and they make a calling to the college, authors, researchers, and scientists so that the scientific production can be in an open access modality. It was in 2012. And from that statement, there was a movement, for example, here, I'm showing some newspaper uh, news where they are showing their uh, disagreement towards some publishers. Uh, pre novel scientist also states his concern about the cost. And they invite to the open access another group of scientists. In Germany, also want to make a consensus in a new model to have access to the information resources. And they have this uh, library consortium in Germany to make an agreement on how to guarantee an open access. Thousands of scientists ask for the information resources can be more and more in open access and not behind the walls of payments. There are other interesting propositions from some universities where they offer models or principles on how to negotiate or how to address this type of complexity. This is the most recent. This is from 2020, this newspaper. Something interesting also that I would like to bring for reflection is that here we have a person that we received in the university in a science festival and technological entrepreneurship. And that person says that nowadays we are living a knowledge aristocracy and only one group, a very privileged group, has access to information resources validated and to, with high level scientists. Nowadays, we have access to a lot of information, but also we know that much of this information is behind walls of payments or information that some credibility questioning has, and that we have to work on developing skills when handling information because more and more we see there is information that could intoxicate access to information. It's a new term. Intoxication due to information. And there are some articles and documents already published talking about this challenge we are facing on how we must help or in favor the development of competences and skills to discriminate the information that is more and more accessible in internet by different means. Well, now I want to focus my attention more and more to the opportunity we see on the free access resources. You might remember that in the framework we mentioned of the 2030 agenda in the ODS4 objective, in one of the goals, they mentioned that the free access resources have a potential to in favor equitable and inclusive education. And here we have an important initiative worldwide. It was the Second World Congress of Educational Resources that was in Slovenia in 2017. And here in this Congress, where they were people from different places in the world, researchers, scientists, project leaders, and they called five action areas. 
that I'm going to address now. These five lines are broken down and in each one of them, they make recommendations, specific recommendations. And the paper is in English and French. And here I translated it into Spanish, like from stakeholders. Uh, and here the stakeholders, they invite the library with their experts and librarians will be as an important catalyzer, natural catalyzer actor to develop some of these focuses they propose. The first point they mention is to develop the capability of users to find, the, to reuse, create, and share open educational resources. And between the different action lines they mentioned, we can identify from the library some action lines or initiatives we can start. For example, about challenge of finding information resources. Like I said, in the world, there is a lot of information where and how to find open educational resources in this framework of the internet. Once we find them, how do we know which resources we can reuse and which ones, from which one we can derivate other type of resources or works. And for that, we need to be able to develop training, civilization, instruction, guidance, digital literacy, references, things that are very natural, actions that are so natural to us. So that how can we start developing a training program to adopt educational resources that are open? For example, how do we know that the open educational resource has author rights or a usage consensus for us to put it in the educational process? We would need to know very well what open licenses are or the ones that are bit commons. And we need to know on which platform the resources are and how to share this type of resources or tools with the library. And this is in the first point, making awareness and skills to use open educational resources. The second action point is to share open educational resources and how from the library we make sure to share. Number one, adopt open educational resources in our supply to share with our users so that they can have the confidence that the resources are already validated, they are reliable, and that they can use in their educational process and that can contribute for the academic quality and educational quality they are pursuing. And the third point is to discover open educational resources. It is important to have a curation or a selection of open educational resources. Then we must also allow users to find by themselves uh, open educational resources. And these open educational resources can be discovered directly on our catalog digital library, or if we help them to discover these resources on internet with certain guidelines or criteria that will help them to work on their strategies as they are looking for information. All this is on the first work line proposed in the action plan from Slovenia. There is a second action line and it is also a concern because open educational resources that are available on the internet, not necessarily are in the language we need or, or not necessarily they take care of some cultural aspects we have to watch when we incorporate or take ownership of these resources for our context. 
how do we know how to translate these resources? Which ones can we translate? And how can we adopt these resources in the educational process and from the library? We can support our teachers, professors, students, designers, instructional designers, or work teams that help in the remote education program for them to identify which open educational resources they can adopt and which ones they can adapt to the cultural context they wish. And for this, it is important to have uh, worked on the previous point and foster and promote the development of the adaptation of these open educational resources and facilitate strategies that help them break these cultural barriers. I'm sure you can visualize that this work cannot be done by ourselves. We have to work with other areas in the university, other areas in the educational institutions, with the professors, with the legal area, etc., so that together we can give a strategy that helps the institution to adopt these open educational resources. The third point that has, has to do with guaranteeing um, this open and inclusive and equitable access for these quality resources is challenging because on one hand talks about guaranteeing access to open educational resources and not only in the natural means or digital electronic means, but also we have to watch the forms or formats and technologies in which these open educational resources are produced. If we have an open educational resource and for us to be able to use it, it requires the buying of a software license or the purchasing of the access to a platform, then it's not really free access because now there is an obstacle or a limitation in the adoption of it. And this is also important to take care of. Also, the accessibility of open educational resources, there are many materials and we need to select them, categorize them and give them a lot of visibility. And when we do that, then they ask us to make sure that these open educational resources And we need to be careful and help in the adoption in these formal, non-formal learning environments, the remote ones and combined ones, also called hybrid models. The fourth point to work is develop and adopt finance sustainability models. And this is a strong challenge because when we adopt open educational resources, for example, an institutional repository or a, a topic repository, thematic repository, they have a cost. So we need to discover and clearly make evident how this initiative or project is going to be sustained in the financial uh, feasibility throughout time. And for that, they invite us to be able to promote the development of new policies, incentives, or practices for recognition and to adopt these open educational resources. An example of this type of policies is open access policies, open access mandates, policies that help the institution to have a position and that also allow the academy and the institution members to adopt those open educational resources under a sustainable framework of development. Then point five, they ask us to in favor the conditions for this policy development for the adoption, promotion, and implementation of support practices for these open educational resources. Ensure we have these sustainable financing models that we commented. They are so connected to the previous point and give incentives and sensibilization to the staff, teachers, faculty for them to share their materials, for them to be 
available in the open access. Then in 2019, two years later, there was a general conference from the UN in Paris. And as you can see, there's a confirmation or reaffirmation of the five points we just mentioned that were dealt in Slovenia. And this is so positive because it helps us to have a reference framework that we can take for our initiatives and justify this as well with the sustainable development initiatives. I want to share a case that we documented some years ago in 2013. And you can consult this and download it in a free access. We call this model a academic mobilization model with contents or the mobilization for the open educational resources adoption. And there is also a new concept after this open educational resource called open educational practices. And as you can see in this model, there are four big momentums on one hand. The one of them, the first one, it has an intentionality to share open educational resources and to make them available to the public and even anyone else, these resources that can be adopted. There is a second momentum where we need to select and identify the resources that are add value to the institution in our community. There is a third momentum for the spreading and to promote the visibility. And finally, an adoption and a mobilization for this specific context that is determined. These four momentums or stages help to synthesize, briefly synthesize, what we have commented in the previous points and we can map the actions in each one of them. For, if, for those who are new in this topic of open educational resources and open educational practices, I leave you here an updated definition from 2019 and for the recommendations in this General Assembly in Paris. Open educational resources are these materials for learning, teaching, and research in any format and means where they are in the public dominion or are subject to author rights that are published under an open license and that allow access reuse without cost, purpose, adaptation, and redistribution by others. Open license is a brief definition here. It's a mechanism that allows to communicate uses con and usage conditions of the material respecting the intellectual property rights, giving these permissions for others to know what we can do with this material and to have clear the scope of the contents we are finding. We are talking about a new panorama, an uh, open knowledge ecosystem. And in this brief exposition in which we are moving forward, I have talked about open educational resources, open access, open licenses, and public dominion. There are other topics that are important in the ecosystem that later would be nice to mention that have to do with open data, open science, open recognitions, open data from the government technology, open source, open education, and open programs to favor education. As you can see, there's a lot where we can start working now. Now, a brief summary of the uh, open access to knowledge. We can see that there are information resources. On one hand, have all the rights reserved. And little by little, some of these resources are getting licenses, open licenses, 
and that also allows us to have more access to resources. There are other resources that start in the public dominion and that later, within time, they will move to this modality. Now, <laughs> Creative Commons licenses. Here we can see some of them. It is important that as to know these type of licenses as a library in the process of adoption of these open educational resources and in the process of guiding the college professors and teachers on how they can take advantage of these open educational resources in their educational process. For example, you can see the least restrictive licenses on the top and the most restricted licenses towards the bottom on this chart. And you can see on this chart that every resource with a Creative Commons license must guarantee open access with no cost. And they must guarantee the attribution or recognition to the author. What could change or vary are the possible uses or permits the material has, like sharing, showing, having some adaptations, derivational works, and even the commercial usage. There are tools that are very important in favoring universities, help universities to have successful programs. For example, Creative Commons show this 2017 report and they show there are more than 1.4 billion resources of education with open license in different platforms, technological platforms, whether it's video, audio, text, books, and so on and so forth. And here we can see some of the initiatives that have been successful and that have made evident or shown the positive economical impact in the adoption of textbooks in the educational process and that has allowed them to have efficiencies or important savings on this topic. There is other type of tools like the one given by Lumen Learning. This is an open access initiative and it gives us a calculator to have scenarios of the cost or savings we could have in these open educational resources. And this is really important when we can document and show the impact, the positive impact we are going to have in the institution in the process of the adoption of these open educational resources. There are many institutions worldwide, organizations that are working on this topic of the open educational resources, open education. And I would invite you to check the directory or the world map of open educational resources where you can identify projects, organizations, leaders on these projects so that later you can consult and then learn or adopt these technologies or projects of open access on these open educational resources. The library environment, again, there are other challenges we have, like the adoption of open access resources, magazines, for example, the DOAG directory that offers more than 11,000 journals and more than 6 million articles available for our users. We can also identify the repository directory, DOAG, where you can see they have identified more than 5,700 repositories worldwide with open access resources. Especially, you can see the type of content. They are magazines, articles, journals, pieces, books, book chapters, lectures, and other type of reports and materials. And especially, the language is English. That's why we mentioned that an obstacle that could uh, up here is the language and the adoption and translation of those materials for them to be used in an educational initiative or process. There are other important initiatives such as paywall 
that also offered today that if you go to the internet website of this uh, supplier, this is open access and they identify more than 30 million articles that are free with free access that you can consult and download. And there are some technological apps that can be installed in the browser. And they say that this app they give with no cost downloads more or less 10 articles per second worldwide. What are some of the challenges? And with this, I am closing the presentation for today. The content curation and the presentation of the role we must take from the library in this content curation. On one hand, identify all this information. Identifying this information is not easy work. Identifying sources of information, reliable uh, sources with academic value, and discovering this information resources is an important challenge. Then assess, select, contextualize, and have this curation process is another important process to be able to adopt, mobilize these educational resources, and then share them worldwide. You can see the challenge and the role we have. And I would invite you to close the session today that from the library, we can motivate and empower students, inspire education, educators, and transform the future of education with these open educational resources that are inclusive and some characteristics to close the benefits we can document in our prepositions and comment in this awareness and civilization process is that we can innovate with open educational resources and open educational practices in the learning and teaching process. We can also help to reduce the access barriers to information and give opportunities to everyone. And it helps on the equity and inclusion and we can choose learning materials with high quality and important content with no cost. We can empower educators to adopt and customize their learning materials. And of course, we can save money and give initiatives of efficiency for the institution with this free access educational resources. And with this, I close the session today. And I would like to ask you to move to the next question I have here for you. Just let me see here so that we can go to the next question. And that we can reflect on the closing of this session today. And I will appreciate your comments by chat. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the session. And then we can go to the Q&A session. Just give me a second, please. I don't know if the moderators can help me if there are questions while I show the next question we have, please. Yes, a lot of people give you congratulations. The first question says, what are the origins of the curation term? Because we can share uh, some references about it. Yeah, this curation term comes from different contexts. And I am taking a reference that is the content curation. And if you browse in the databases of your library, or internet, 
you are going to find different references. I am adopting this term for this process to discover information, select information, make this evaluation of the information resource, and then give quality resources that are reliable for the audiences we serve. Thank you very much. And this question was by Gabriela Cruz Martinez, and she has another one. Inf data information curation and contents is linked to every process of development for open educational resources. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please, and go a little bit slowly to really understand it? Of course, the curation of data, information, and contents is linked in all the processes for development and diffusion of open educational resources. So if in all the process, do you need to have curation in all the process? Yes, in all the process to be able to identify the open educational resources. Yeah, there is a curation process. Maybe, it, can you put more information in the chat, more information of your doubt, of your question, so that we can enrich the answer? Thank you. There are more questions. Sara Maria from Patrocinio, or sponsor. Important, what is related to production, mobilization, and the development of technological tools to guarantee free and inclusive access? From Sara Maria del Patrocinio Rodriguez. Okay, but it's not a question. It's just a comment. Here's a question by Teresa Luna. Could you elaborate more about digital resources serving the teacher's planification? About open educational resources? Yeah, where can they find digital resources to plan their practices? Good. In some of the slides, I showed some directories. I showed the open educational resources map and there are many projects and initiatives where they can see open educational resources i showed the creative commons there is a special uh, searcher and there are other initiatives from specialized journals or magazines like the the rack open magazine directory the open uh, repository direct director if you use google and if you go to the advanced search you can have specialized searchings with some filters for that to filter images with creative common uses license or with a free access thank you so much elizabeth guerrero asks how can we incentive teachers and researchers to bring products on open platforms. It's an interesting challenge. We cannot do it by ourselves. We have to do this along with other academical areas. And this is the opportunity area we have to link, to strengthen the academic linkage with groups of professors, researchers, to be able to work together with them in initiatives or programs to adopt open educational resources. From the library, we can trigger initiatives such as uh, preservation of uh, digital theses and to have an institutional repository of open access theses. In our case, in the institution, we have an open access repository with open access materials. And one of the processes we triggered in the last years through uh, open access policy is this uh, open thesis deposit. Thank you very much. They asked from Zedotech, are there data from Mexico on the debt students have for private education? Like the example you mentioned about the US. No, I don't have that reference, but I can work on that. I can research on that as well. 
Good. Silvia Irene Adame Rodriguez, thanks for your presentation. And she's asking if it's possible to share if there is a documented collaboration of companies, industry laboratories in the movement of the open access resources and practices. The information is published in articles, presentations, lectures, and all this material is uh, in different information sources, in different technological platforms. This is the challenge we have to identify those materials. And if we want to identify this type of document, I invite you to consult the open educational resources map because in this map, you can identify specific projects and each project has the documents on how it was made. It was made with a university or jointly with a company to supply this type of materials. And there is annually, there is an important event, the Open Education Week. And there they share important experiences on this type of projects. Thank you very much. Martin Adalberto Tena Espinosa asks, what would be the roadmap if a university library has to use to develop a strategy towards open education and the open educational resources for the institution they serve? Very good question. And there is some material about it. Some years ago, I also took part in a project with a European community, the Alpha Project and the Opportunity Project. And in this project, we worked on the roadmap that we must take to adopt open educational resources in our institutions. There are some documented materials. Now, my recommendation is first, know what it is about, make a sensitiveness, awareness, be documented, know what the topic is about, the scopes and implication it has. And when we are aware and when we have documentation of what the open educational resources and the open uh, access resources and the new challenges we are going to face on open science, then we can start to give actions, simple actions, for example, having this adoption process in open educational resources and share them to the community. This is a first action that is, has, it doesn't require a lot of cost or effort or energy to start to work on this open educational resources topic. They give resources and facilitate them for them to be adopted. Then that process gives you an expertise because it helps us to know the open licenses know what projective commons is and then from library empower or give actions thank you so much sandra carolina subju garcia asked is it possible to make an initiative of an open educational resources the translation from english to the native spanish from the materials in the repositories it is possible i mentioned there's a lot of materials in English, and sometimes it is difficult to take this material and bring it to our, our educational process directly because we need to check the nuances, check the language and cultural situations. And for this, we need to identify that the material allows the modification. There is some Creative Commons license that allows you to make derivational work because translating from one language to another is a derivation, is another product, then it has to be clear that this product or that material allows us to make this adaptation or modification. We continue to receive many questions. Carmen H says, can you share the URL for the Open Educational Resources World Map? And I think they can put it in the comments. I have an interesting question. When you show the type of resource, like in DOAR, for example, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the 
open educational resources inclusion in this map, we are used to literature thesis repositories. How much are we including the OERs? How big is the participation in this repository world? More and more, this movement is growing, this open educational resources, especially in the United States. And we need, in Latin America, we need to start more projects. But there are clear and successful examples that we can capitalize and learn from them. Thank you so much. And we continue to uh, receive questions and comments. Pilar del Toro asks, can you talk about author rights in the Mexican legislations about the open science? She's from the University of Veracruz, Universidad Veracruzana. In my presentation, I mentioned that we cannot go alone in this initiative. And in these initiatives we have deployed, we uh, have the participation of different areas and stakeholders, especially when talking about legislation and author rights, intellectual property, we go with a legal area of our institution. A specialized lawyer guides us on the initiatives we want to start or the initiatives we want to start or develop because not necessarily we are experts on those uh, legislation topics. We need the company of the experts. Thank you. And we continue to receive questions. Francisco Suarez Valencia is asking, do you think that the digital database, uh, database market can be replaced by the OER repositories or can these ones be a complementary thing? I think it can be a complementary aspect more and more worldwide. Open access movement is taking more and more energy. There are more and more open access resources and open educational resources. And it is important for us to trigger initiatives of adoption and inclusion in our programs. I see this as a complementary point. Thank you very much. We continue. And now they are saying this, this is it. There are a lot of comments and congratulations. We still have many things like you were talking about the challenges. We have to implement other projects to strengthen the OERs in Latin America and to close. Is there any comment, uh, last thought you would like to share? Yeah, I want to mention that I have included the website with the answers from the last question. And we can see that the challenges that are identified by the audience have to do especially with the library found formation. We must be trained and develop new skills, spread the knowledge we have presented and some other important topics. This cloud can be shared. And I think the project is going to share it, the presentation as well. And we can share this one too. Now, I would invite to collaboration, to work within the institution and with other areas or with other universities. It helps a lot so that we don't have to start from scratch and have continuity in some projects that can be held in other institutions and then have synergy. And for this, for this, there are important forums and networks to have this type of initiatives. Thank you so much for what you have shared. We remind you that the presentations are going to be available in the project official website, and you can answer. If you don't have the opportunity to see this live, you can answer the forms later on, answer the questions, and don't forget to enter your attendance so that you can get the certificate. Again, thank you very much for what you have shared. There are a lot of questions from the author rights, uh, incorporation of the open educational resources and access. We hope we can collaborate in the future and to hear from you so that we can continue with this collaboration in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I congratulate the project and all of you 
for giving yourself the opportunity to explore these concepts and topics. Have a wonderful day.